Everyone together sing our thoughts. Would you fall on me? God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. He wants to dwell with his people today. You thought you came to church, but he called you to have church. Hallelujah. Let's take a few moments to honor him in our lives, to honor his presence in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. The anointing of the Holy Spirit now dwelling in us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Dwell in our hearts. Dwell in our minds. We honor your presence. Jesus. We're sending the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing us back to Christ over and over again. Thank you. Oh, yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You need a touch in your body today, whatever it is. God has your answer. God has your provision. Just lift your hand to him right where you are. And begin to ask the Lord for those things that you have need of. As you praised him, as you sowed your seed of praise, and you're going to reap his presence. For well, the Lord dwells and inhabits the praises of his people. And as you sow your praise to heaven, you're going to reap his presence in your life. Thank you, Jesus. As you sow your prayers, you're going to reap answers. Thank you, Jesus. Whatsoever a man doth sow, he shall reap. You got to see what you do as a sowing. You got to see your actions uh, 
toward God and your actions toward things in life is a sowing. You're sowing your time right now. One of the prophets was told that he would be tilled and sown. God wants to time in his presence so that he can till you. He can turn over some rough dirt, some rough ground, so that he can sow you into the things that, uh, that you belong in. and Sow you into the lives of people that are around you. And God wants to make more of you than you can make of yourself. Thank you, Jesus. But you've got to see what you do as a sowing. You've got to see what you, where you are, even in this very moment, is a sowing. You're sowing your time to be in the presence of the Lord. How many can see that today? How many can see that God wants you to see things in more than a doing? It's more than doing. This is the problem. We fall into the rut of doing. And when we fall into the rut of doing, we can only reap from the rut a sense of doing or sense of duty. But I believe God has so much more than that for us. How many believe that today? Over and over in the scripture, the scripture talks about sowing and reaping. That's not just money. It's time. It's, it's your life. It's everything. Everything's about sowing. In fact, in the very beginning, it was God who created the seed. He said, I created the, the grass and the seed-bearing fruit, meaning that whatever it is he creates, it's able to reproduce of itself over and over again and if God has created your praise in your heart today it's going to produce something come on it's going to produce the scripture says he inhabits the praises so when the praises go up his presence manifests when the worship is dedicated the glory of the Lord fills the house whatever is presented to him in, in a sowing fashion there's a reaping process. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to his spirit shall reap the things of the spirit. Come on, this is what God is saying today. Change your approach. Not just what you're doing, but change your approach to the way you do things. And see that what you do is a sowing, whether it's helping somebody, whether it's giving, whether whatever it is, it's all seed that God has given to you to sow. Can you say amen? amen. And right now, I just pray that that revelation quicken within your heart. See, this is not a church that just tells you what to do. There's a lot of churches and there's a lot of people out there that will just tell you what to do. Our mission is to bring you to the person who can tell you what to do. Amen. How many know what his name is? Jesus. Name is Jesus Christ. Jesus. That's the mission of the church is to provide and facilitate things so that people can connect with God for themselves. And they can begin to do and live the life that he wants them to live. And they can do the things that he's ordained for them to do. For he has created good works that we should walk in. There are people around you he's created to be there. There are circumstances he's created that you might be there to show you. Can you say amen? How many know he was the first one sown? He's the firstborn among many brethren. He resurrected. Come on, somebody shout amen. amen. We've got to change not what we do so much, but the manner of mindset in which we do it. We don't do things in duty. We do things in a, in a mindset of sowing. You sow your life. You sow your time. You sow your seed. 
And God says he's going to bless the seed amen. sown. Yeah. Somebody say amen. amen. Give the Lord a praise. Let me, let me leave you with the scripture. I'm not preaching today. But let me leave you with the scripture. 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 10. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower. Who's he that ministers seed to the sower? Who created the seed? In Genesis chapter 1. God created the seed. And God created the plants. And God created everything that he created with the ability to what? Recreate after its kind. When God created the tomato, he put seed in it. Why? So that it could bring forth more tomatoes. When God created man and woman after his own image, he created with them man, the seed. To what? To reproduce. Amen? Everything God creates and everything God does multiplies. God doesn't take and things don't diminish. When God does something, he multiplies it. Come on, somebody. When God created the tree, he multiplied it. When God created man, he multiplied. When God creates, he multiplies. Somebody say amen if you believe that. Whatever God does, he multiplies. Whatever man does, he tries to imitate, it never multiplies. It just stops, it dies. Man makes a car, it dies. Man makes a house, it falls apart. Man makes clothing, they wear out. What has man made that multiplies in and of itself? What? Absolutely nothing. Everything that man makes has an end. But things that God makes, things that God does, it continues, it multiplies over and over and over again. And that's why the word says this, he that ministered seed, God ministers seed to the sower. Who's he ministered the seed to? The sower. Why the sower? Because he wants what he creates to multiply. He doesn't want it to stay where it is. He doesn't want you to stay where you're at. He doesn't want you to have what you have. He wants what you have to multiply. He wants who you are to become more. This is the God you're serving. There's more. Somebody shout more. More. There's more. He that ministers seed to the sower, he ministers bread for your food. In other words, there is provision. When is there provision? In the sowing, there is provision for your food. And what? He multiplies your seed sown. Only that which is sown is multiplied. You can have all the tomato seeds you want, and if you hold them in a can in your house, they are not going to grow. Come on. They are not going to grow. You can have all of the best seed. You can have all of the best dirt. You can have all of the best fertilizer. You can have all of the best compost. You've saved all your eggshells and all of your vegetables and you've got it all in one area of your yard and you stunk up the yard and the neighbors are complaining, but you got great compost. But until it's tilled and until it's sown, there is no multiplication. He multiplies your seed sown and increases the fruits somebody say increase the fruits plural more because one seed you see if I have one apple it's one apple but if I plant a seed I get an apple tree 
How many know I have multiple apples? Somebody hear what I'm saying today? God wants you to have the mindset of a sower that everything in your life is to be viewed as sowing. Good words are sowing. Good things, good deeds. Whatever it is that you have, whatever it is you know, it's for sowing purposes. Why? So that you're sowing and can multiply and increase the fruits, what? Of your righteousness. Your righteousness, it, it grows. It doesn't stay at one level. Come on, somebody somebody here, how many of you are growing in the righteousness that God has provided for you? And as he has sown himself into your life, Jesus has sown himself into your life. And he increases as we sow him. And what he's given us, can you shout amen? amen. He increases the fruits of your righteousness. Glory to God. It's all about a seed. And it's all about the sowing process. This will continue forever. This is why the enemy hates this. Because, you know, I, I watch a lot of preachers and they talk about seeds sown. And then where it becomes corrupt is they start coercing certain amounts of money out of people. That's not what th this is about. They start coercing $1,000 seed, and then they start manipulating. They take the truth, and then they start on their own venture. And that's where it gets corrupt. And there's a lot of preachers out there today that are very corrupt. And that there are a lot of policemen that are corrupt. There are a lot of lawyers that are corrupt. There are a lot of sheep that are corrupt. There's a lot of corruption everywhere. Well, let's keep it pure. What is the pure truth? The pure truth is everything you have has been given to you. And everything you have is seed to be sown. Nothing you have is to be kept locked up. But you, are, and here's where the corruption comes in, you are going to have to determine that. Not the preacher, not somebody else for you. That's where the corruption comes in. When people start determining for you what you should do. You need to determine for yourself what needs to be sown. And that's how you keep it pure. Are you with me? Amen. And how God has blessed you and how he continues to bless you is going to be determined upon you and what you do with what he has given you. Are you with me? If you sow what he's given you, he will increase the fruits of your righteousness and bless you and multiply you. If you hold on to what he's given you, it will diminish and corrupt and die. And that is the truth. The sowing and the reaping of the scripture is a law that will continue as long as the sun and the moon continue. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? You have what God has allowed you to have. You are right now who you have allowed God to let you become. Some of you have stopped God. And say, well, that's enough, God. I'll do what I want. He says, no, get out of the way. Sow what you have, sow what you are, so I can multiply you and bless you and increase you. I'm here for increase today. How many are here for increase today? Now, it has a lot to do with money because if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter we talk about the glorification and resurrection of, of who we are right first Corinthians 15 the next chapter first Corinthians chapter 16 starts out with this now concerning the collection for the saints 
So he goes from this glorious revelation to a very practical thing. You see, your blessings are not only going to materialize in a super sensational way, they're going to materialize in very natural ways. Come on. God is going to use you in very natural ways. And he's going to bless you in natural ways as well. But what has to happen? What is multiplied? Seed sown. Can you say amen? amen? And I wasn't planning to say all that today. But I feel that we have to change our mindset. And even in our offering, we have to see it as seed sown. Not as just giving, but what we have, God has allowed us to have, and we're sowing. And as a result, God says he will multiply our seed sown and he will increase the fruits of our righteousness. Somebody say, I receive it, amen. And I sow it, amen. I receive it and I sow it. I sow it and I receive it. And that's how it continues to multiply, amen. And so I guess we could take the offering now. I guess it wasn't meant to be, but it's a good time. If you have need of an envelope for your seed. And I'm not going to tell you what to do. That's between you and God. God will tell you. And there are times when there are special offerings that the preacher can tell you, sure. But for the overhaul, you need to honor God with your tithe, whatever that may be, and your offering, and see it as seed. Can you say amen? So when you have your offering, your envelope, you bring it down, place it in the basket, and so, amen? amen. The Lord bless you today, and bless your seed sown. We're going to have a word of prayer. I can have an usher come help me. Take the two offering baskets and please bring them up to me. You're coming with your seeds. Come on, bring it down. Bring that up right up here. Place them together. Put them together. Put it right up here. Thank you. Seed. Come on. See. Come on. He's not going to reap anything if he keeps that seed. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Come on, Dad. Now you're going to reap. There you go. Anybody else? No sowing, no reaping. And the only people that have a problem with the offering are people that don't understand this. They don't understand, they think it's taking. I can tell you this much, tithers, there you go, never complain about offerings in this church. It's always the people that don't give anything that complain. Are you hearing me? Because they don't see it as sowing. They see it as taking, amen? And so right now, if you sowed seed here, I want you to stretch your hands toward this basket. 
This basket represents a basket full of seed. Your seed. Your seed sown. And I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I plant that seed. And I pray that it's blessed. And that it would bring forth fruit. More than what I gave. Because that's your desire to multiply my seed sown. And God, I pray for a return on my own life. A good measure return. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Cause men to sow into my life. Even what I sow. Whatever it is I sow. I pray that it come back to me in the mighty name of Jesus without hindrance and without demonic delay. I receive my blessings from you, Lord Jesus, who gave me the seed to sow. In Jesus' mighty name, come on, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I've been saying for a few weeks now we have to change our mindset about our giving it's not just giving it's sowing and you say amen children at this time may be dismissed for children's church ages 4 through 11 and Pastor Robert's going to share I don't know if he has a song or a message but that's up to him look at your neighbor and say you're looking mighty good today amen Sow good things into your life, and you'll look better. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Sorry I took so long with that offering, but I just tell you, the Lord has been putting on my heart to tell the people to change their mindset. That the things that they're doing are good, but have the right mind about it. Amen? And the right faith. That whatever you do, do it in faith. Don't just do it in, in ritual or, or, you know, over and over, repetition. Do what you do in faith and watch how God begins to bless your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. the first chapter if you have your Bibles. We'll begin in verse 1 and read down to verse 8. Acts chapter 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times, all the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. 
but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth would you put your hands together and give the Lord some praise for his name we thank you Lord today for your word we believe that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth Lord I'm asking today that your people would be aware of your power and aware of your strength that, Lord, you would move mightily in this time. In Jesus' name, we all sit in agreement. Amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Glory to God. Good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, as I went before the Lord this week, asking him what to share and uh, what we were going to uh, attempt to establish in your hearts this week, it is my prayer that God would awaken in you today an understanding of really how powerful his resurrection is and the power that is presently available if you would become consciously aware that there is resurrection power available today, right now in your life, that you don't have to wait or for some future event, you don't have to wait for something else to take place. But today, even right now, God's power is available in your life. And that, that's my prayer, that God would awaken that. That God would revive your ability to see that he is with you. Um, that you would be awakened to the fact that God is here even right now and able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ask or think according to the power that worketh in you. How many believe God wants to work inside of them? You'd be lying if you told me that there are times that you feel alone and feel as if God's presence is not there. And uh, sometimes the Lord allows us to feel this way just so we could appreciate how great it is when we feel him and know that he is with us in everything that we're going through and everything we're facing. Would you bow your heads as we pray, as we attempt to dive into the word. Lord, help us to rightly divide it. Help us to understand what it is that you're saying. Help us, Lord, to properly assess the value that's fine in your word and Lord enable us to receive it by faith to mix faith with the word so that it would bring great profit to our lives in Jesus mighty name we all send an agreement amen and amen give the Lord one more hand clap of praise I want to talk to you about getting past whatever it is that you have been stuck on getting past it and how that you need the resurrection power of our Lord to get past it. How many need to get past some things? Past some trials? Past some things that have had a grip on you and have a hold on maybe your mind, or maybe your perspective, maybe your approach to life, maybe the way you process things and the way you think concerning what you experience in life, but God is able to help you to get past it. Can you say amen? amen? Must be more than a theological understanding. It's important to understand the word of God, no doubt. And without understanding it, we are far less than what God could ever want us to be. But just knowing the theory without having a present experience with the Lord will shortchange your Christian experience and your walk with God. And the book of John, the 11th chapter, tells us the time where Lazarus has departed to the other side and he is, as plain as it could be said, he is dead. And Jesus comes to visit the place and 
Lazarus' death in Bethany, and as he approaches the place, Martha greets him and says to him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother would be alive. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha, having the theology, having an understanding of the end of days, an understanding that there would be a resurrection, she answers rightly. She says, I know, Lord, that in the last day that uh, my brother will rise again with you. You know it's easy to believe God is going to do something way down in your future. It's easy to believe there's joy 20 years ahead. It's easier to believe sometimes that there's a heaven than to believe that God can deliver you right now. Sometimes that really is easier. Sometimes it's easier to believe in an afterlife than it is to believe in a better life right now. And so Martha, she has the theology down. I know my brother will rise again at the last day. And Jesus looks at Martha. And in essence, he's saying, no, this is going to be more than just the theology you learn. This is going to be more than theory. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I, I'm here right now. I, I don't want you to wait on something that's already present in your life. And there will be plenty of blessings you've got to wait on, but you don't have to wait on resurrection power. Why wait on something that's already available to you now? What are you waiting for? Jesus is here right now. You don't have to wait to see resurrection power. You don't have to wait to see your brother raised from the dead. I, I am here. I, I know that you thought it was going to happen at the end of days. I know some of the things that I'm going to do and show you are going to defy your theology and your understanding. I know it's going to be greater than anything you could have imagined, but I want you, Martha, for one moment to have the courage to believe that I can do it right now, today, in your present life. Somebody give the Lord a great big hand of praise if you believe God can do it today. He can do it right now. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I love how God calls us to be courageous enough to step out of our doctrine, to step out of our theology and believe just simply the fact that God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think he can defy our perspective he's larger than our viewpoint and our scope of understanding he is bigger than all of our problems bigger than all of our fears bigger than whatever we're facing he is the resurrection and the life somebody give Jesus a shout of praise in this place. In Philippians, the third chapter, we have the great writing of the Apostle Paul illustrating to us and laying out the highlights of really his life. All of his achievements, all of his accomplishments, all of the things he had done the Apostle Paul was not your less than average, but he is your above average overachiever. He accomplishes great things. He's not happy being second place. He has to be first. If he goes to school, he has to be the best. If he's going to do something, he wants to be at the top of the list. He's your go-getter. He's not settling for less than his best. He's always pursuing his best. And he is uh, giving us a highlight reel of really everything that he accomplished. 
and what he did throughout the course of his life. And after he does that, he comes to a place where he says, I count it all loss for the excellency of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection. I'll stop there. There's much more to it. But uh, I don't think you would want to stay as long as it would take to deal with all of this. We'll stop there. That I may know him, the power of his resurrection. Paul, in this account, is an example of the parable that Jesus shared with us of a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. And when he found a pearl of great price, he sold all that he had and he purchased that pearl. He's a man, and the key that I want you to center in on is the fact that Paul recognized the value in Christ and he took all of his accomplishments, all of his achievements, all of it, and he nailed it to the cross, realizing that it was not even able to compare, not worthy to compare with who Jesus was and the knowledge that came, the knowledge by experience that came through knowing our Lord Jesus. This is a man that spent years and years serving the Lord and still had the, the anticipation and the hope that he would know more than he knew presently. Isn't that good to know that you haven't learned everything there is to learn about God? He would learn through his achievements, is what I want you to focus in, how little they compared with serving the Lord. You see, it's amazing to me how many people without achievements pat themselves on the back and don't realize the lack of perspective and depth of insight they have due to settling for less than their best. It's easy to come to church every Sunday when you have nowhere else to be. Anybody can come to church when they have no, I'm amazed when people with no jobs say to me, it's hard to get to church on Sunday morning. I'm, I'm saying to myself, you've got a lot more problems than you realize. <laughs> you've got some real issues, you know? If, if, it's, if it's hard to get to church when you don't have a job, imagine when God blesses you. Somebody recently said to me, you know, I wish that, the stores were closed on Sunday morning like years ago because people all went to church. And I agreed in a moment and went home. I said, you know what? I'm kind of happy they're open. It really shows me who's in church because they want to be. And it shows me how ridiculous some of the things people think are more important than God really are. They will put coals before God. They, they will put overtime, and even if you get time and a half, what are you talking about, two, three hundred dollars in a week? You're, you're gonna put that before God. <laughs> that, that comes before God. It's easy to you know, you hear people say, well, when I come into money, I'll give in the off. Of course you will when it doesn't hurt you anymore. The, of course you will when it doesn't cost you anything. Of course you can show up to church when you have no children. But when your children have a party on Sunday morning, now, now we'll see what's really important. Anyone can go to the altar and get married and say they're willing to forsake all others when nobody else wants them. You're not vowing anything. Nobody wants you. You're just happy somebody's at the altar willing to marry you because you convinced them for a little while. 
But when everyone loves you and when you've achieved so much and when you've got places to be and people love you and everyone wants to be around you and everyone's calling you, inviting you to their parties and everyone wants, now, now let's see what you put first. When every woman likes you and you get married to the one you love, now, now we're talking about when every man is trying to get you but you make that vow to be faithful to your husband. Now we're talking about some real genuine, genuine commitment. What you learn, in, you see, a lot of people might say that Paul, uh, because he counted all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of God, that maybe it wasn't worth achieving anything. Maybe he should have just laid it all down and, and did nothing and just sought the Lord. But that would be an oversimplification and dismissive of the process which each and every one of us are supposed to go through. That process is that we discover God's power and strength in the achievement. We discover that what we always wanted is not enough. We discover as we achieve things that uh, what we always thought would make us happy doesn't make us happy. So what happens is you start off discovering that through one achievement at a time. And first you start by saying, when I graduate high school, I'll be happy. But you graduate and find it wasn't enough. And so you go to college and you get your degree and you think that achievement will make you happy. And then you get the job of your dreams and you're not happy. And then you get the car and you get the house and you get the spouse and you get the kids and you get the vacations and you've got it all. And you start to at some point discover in the achievement that it wasn't enough, that you needed the resurrection power of the Lord. That's why some of us put everything aside to get to church. And don't get mad at us because we've come to the end of the road and realize that the things that we thought would make us happy have not made us happy. And the job and the money and the house and the kids, they weren't enough. That's why some of us lay everything aside and count it all loss. And we know that no matter what there's no place that we'd rather be than the, the house of the Lord. It was discovered in the achievement. It was discovered in the success that I, I read the last page of the book of my life and I realized I still wanted to go on. It, it wasn't over. It wasn't all that I wanted. And I don't know what achievement it takes in your life for you to get to that place. But I'm so glad I achieved enough to say I need more than just what this world has to offer. I need resurrection power. Somebody shout yes. I discovered it in the achievements. Don't tell me you don't want something you never had. I meet a lot of preachers in my life and the ones with the smallest churches always say they don't want a large church. And I say, well first you gotta get one to decide what you want. I meet a lot of broke people that say to me, well, you know, it's not about money. Well, you tell me that when you have the money. Well, you know, it's not about just getting married and getting a house. Well, if you're still living in your mother's house, I, I guess that's a way to dismiss all the desires that everyone else has. I guess that's a coping mechanism that you're using. But honestly, you've got to get it before you can tell me it's not worth it. 
And see, the good thing about those of us that really achieved some level of success, whatever it was, see, I got out of life what I wanted. I tried everything I wanted to try. I did everything that I thought would make me happy. I achieved that. It may not have been the achievement you wanted, but it was what I wanted. It's what I at least thought I wanted. And when I got it, I realized it's not enough. I read the end of the book of my life right then and realized I wanted more. Some of you have gotten to that place, glory to God. You achieved some level, some level of success that you thought would make you happy, but it didn't, it wasn't enough. I, I met Jesus and it wasn't enough. I needed him again. And I've been to church once and I wasn't satisfied. I needed to come back again. That's why in the achievement I discovered resurrection power. Somebody that's discovered God in your achievements. You discovered him through your successes. You discovered him when you accomplished things. You discovered him when you overcame things. You discovered him in the achievement. Somebody shall resurrection power. got to get it before you can tell me what it's really worth. It's not worth going to 11 years of school to be a doctor. Well, let the doctor tell me that. Stop speaking for people. Stop oversimplifying things. Let people that have experience and knowledge in areas speak into your life. Let them tell you things. Stop being so dogmatic and set on what you believe. Find somebody that's a success, young people, and ask them what field you should go into. Don't let some college professor push you into some program because they need to fill seats in college and there's no jobs. And you're stuck with student loans with no career. If you like nature, if you do well in business, you can take a lot of vacations. You don't have to be a naturalist. You can do it another way. But you've got to get it. And Paul had it. He accomplished it all just to come back to the fact that he discovered in his achievements that they were not enough to make him happy, that he wanted more, that he needed God's resurrection power, and that became the life's pursuit and the life ambition of the Apostle Paul. All he wanted was the power of the resurrection. All he wanted was more of God's presence. That was all he was after, but you can't find that without discovering it in the achievement that's why the parents that are older in here we laugh at young parents that think that, that their children are everything because they don't know what's coming when the child doesn't want you with them yet they have not yet achieved to that level of realizing that uh, everything doesn't work out the way you thought and that your children are their own beings. They don't belong to you ultimately. You're stewards of them. And so when we see parents that are naive to think their children are their entire world, we find them missing church over this and, you know, giving up on their own pursuits, all in sacrifice for the children, only to find out when they're older that you gave your child everything they wanted, but they're seeing the school psychiatrist because they're depressed. And now all, all it's amazing how much you can have and achieve nothing. The rich young ruler had so much but he achieved very little. He still thought the materialistic things he had were more important than a relationship with Jesus. That didn't happen to David. David was an achiever. He 
accomplish things. He started out tending sheep and uh, he grew and grew and improved and improved and became a great instrumentalist and then a psalmist and then a king over districts and then ultimately king of all of Israel when the kingdoms would be combined. This is an achiever and David was willing to lay it all down at the feet of the Lord. But the rich young ruler achieving very little in his perspective, he had a lot, but achieved very little. When Jesus said, go and sell all that you have and follow me, he went away sorrowful. But those of you that have gotten, I pray everyone in this room, you get everything that you ever wanted just to realize it wasn't enough. And there's a verse in the Bible that says God gave them the desires of their heart, but he sent leanness to their soul. So he gave you what you wanted, you realized it wasn't enough. He gave you the wife you always wanted, and it wasn't enough. Gave you the children, gave you the house, gave you the job, but it wasn't enough. Let's be careful not to do that in the church. Every preacher is driven, wants to see growth, wants to see the church prosper. I know it, every preacher knows it. But never, never, ever, Put that before the purpose and the appreciation of what's right in front of you. Amen. You have to reach a level of achievement where you realize more would not make you happy. What will make you happy is when you align yourself with the will of God. Am I preaching to myself? Yes. Am I preaching to you? I hope so. It will never be enough. And if this church explodes, which I believe and pray does happen, and there are countless people baptized in the Holy Ghost and saved by the precious blood of Jesus, it should never be enough. We should never be satisfied with any achievement that we reach because we have got to get to the place where we want to know the power of his resurrection. We want more of God. We're not satisfied with even the best that this world has to offer. It just pales in comparison to what God still has available. Somebody give the Lord praise if you believe there's more, there's more, there's more. There's more, and if 10,000 get saved, there's more to do. And if you're blessed abundantly, there's more for God to do. And that's why some of us come to church. We're not just shouting because we want a new car, and we're not just shouting because our family is saved, and we're not just shouting because we saw something else God did in the past. We're after something new. It's why we come and we shout with a voice of triumph, and we lift up our voices, and we invite God to show up again because we still believe there's more somebody shout there's more Paul discovered him and his power in the achievement that really didn't get to the text I know much so much more we could develop out of this. Let's just say a few more things before we close. One being this, you discover his power, the power of his resurrection, not only in your achievements, but in your pain. In your pain. The disciples, when they watched Jesus crucified, you see, again, let's get back to the theory versus the practical understanding. We believe and know Jesus is alive. We can feel his presence. Could you imagine being 
put yourself at the foot of the cross and watching the Savior then pull chunks of his beard out, stick a spear in his side, nail his hands to a cross, Picture the visual imagery that they get, like Joseph, when his coat of many colors was shown to his father Jacob, the image, the visual refused, caused Jacob to refuse to be confident. There are things in your life, there are going to be worse days where you can't get past, or you at least think that you can't get past what you face. Disciples couldn't get past what they saw. They, they loved Jesus. Now they're watching him crucify. This is called post-traumatic stress. This is what every person lives with to some degree or another. And anyone that tells you differently is being delusional or dismissive to the feelings or the emotions of people. And I don't care what Word of faith preacher says you won't face this, that you can just, you know, pretend like it doesn't exist. No, it exists. I see it every day. Watch people that come back from war and see friends killed right next to them. Watch some of the times, or talk to somebody that has been molested as a child and tell them just to let it go. Go ahead, see how that, how that works out for you. See if that's the heart of Christ, to talk to people that way. Or if the heart of Christ is to see people healed and to get past some of the pains that they yeah. experience. Tell the mother that lost a child, just get past it, get over it. And you would have to be really beyond uh, human to even think that way, to go down that road. To be, you, you, there's no mercy in you to talk this way, yet I hear it all the time. Post-traumatic stress is a real thing. Every person to some degree Thinking right now, Brother Carmine told me of a young man that was in prison that he tried to help. And uh, he tried to help, and when he told me the story, I could see how it, it had impacted him. He said to me, you know, I called the parents. He spent many years in the prison system. Not an inmate. <laughs> but uh, he spent many years there, and he said this young man, he called the parents. And I hope you don't mind if I share this because it's very important that they understand this. And uh, he said, I called the parents, I said, get, get him out, he's not built for the prison system, he can't make it. The parents said, no, you know, he needs to learn his lesson. He went away on vacation, he came back, the young man had hung himself in his prison. This is real, talk. this is what happens to us in life. You can see there's some pain there, and it should be. That doesn't go away. That's why we need Jesus to show up in our pain. You can't just pretend it didn't happen. Shut your emotions. You can shut your emotions off for so long until you realize you're not human anymore. You're not functioning anymore. You, you have to feel, you have to experience. You, you've got to go through things. And, and uh, it's more than just your intellect. It's, it's, it's not just what you saw, it's how you feel about what you saw. You know, a lot of people looked at Jesus on the cross, but there were a lot of different feelings about what they saw. Some were happy that Jesus was on the cross. Some were sad. Some didn't know what they believed. and So emotions are a, are a strange thing that people can look at the exact same circumstance but feel entirely different about it. And that's why it took a Savior to come and to show us that there is life beyond our pain. That there is life beyond the worst. And so Jesus had to show himself alive for 40 days 
to the disciples because they couldn't get past the past. And I don't know how long it's going to take you to get past some of the things that you experienced in your life. But let me give you some good news today. Jesus will keep on showing up until he can help you to get past the worst pain, the worst experience, the worst thing that you've ever gone through. You can get past the divorce. You can get past the losing of your job. You can get past the cancer. You can get past the loss of a loved one. You can get past it. Somebody shout, I'm getting past it. With the help of the Lord Jesus. I don't know how many times he's got to show himself alive to you. But he will keep on showing up. Over and over and over and over and over again until you can get past every last pain i know the power of his resurrection in my achievements i i know the power of his resurrection in my pain i know and i want to know the power Christ's resurrection. You all know it if you haven't gone through something. <laughs> Lastly, your anticipation of the future. You need to know the power of his resurrection before you get to your future. We believe all things are possible with God. Here's the problem. All things are possible with God except if God says it's not possible. <laughs> so, what do you do then? Say, what do you mean all things are possible? Didn't Jesus cry out in Gethsemane? Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But it was still there. What happens when everything you prayed would be gone is still there? What happens when you prayed that your child would get right, but they're still all wrong? What happens when you pray that your finances would change and you'd be delivered from debt, but you wake up only to find another call? And what happens when the preacher tells you you're going to be delivered from debt and he proclaims that it's going to happen in a certain amount of time and that time comes up and you get a notice in the mail that they're increasing your interest rate because you didn't have a sealed uh, interest rate. And now what do you do with it? What happens when you pray for something to deliver, to be delivered from, but it's still there? I prayed that this sickness in my body would be gone and it's still there. I, I prayed that the church would prosper, that uh, souls would get saved, and same people are there. I prayed that we would be able to reach out and do more, and the enemy kept attacking in the same areas. I prayed that there would be peace in my house, but there's still turmoil. What happens when you pray for deliverance and it doesn't happen? You learn something about the power of his resurrection. That is, the thing that you thought would kill you didn't kill you. You anticipated that if you had to face this for another day, you couldn't make it. But the bottom line is, after you faced it, and after you said, Lord, if you don't take this away from me, I can't go on. If you don't get this loved one out of my life, they're driving me crazy. I can't make it. My, I'm losing my mind. If you don't fix my finances, then you realize, touch your neighbor and say, I made it. I made it, I made it through some things I thought were going to kill me. 
That's how I learned the power of his resurrection. I realized some of the things I thought had to end yesterday or I wasn't going to make it. They're still here, but guess what? I'm still here. Somebody shout, I'm still here. I made it through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Somebody shout, the Lord is with me. What I thought would kill me, I'm making it through. I didn't think I could make it another day, but somehow, by the power of his resurrection, I'm still here. Somebody shout, I'm here. I made it through trials, and I'll make it through more. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I'm going to keep on living. I'm going to outlive every trial. I'm going to outlive every challenge. I'm going to outlive every vice of the enemy that has been designed to destroy my faith. My faith is going to outlive my present circumstances. Somebody give the Lord one more shout of praise. Touch somebody and tell them I made it. I made it. I made it. I made it. Made it. Keep on making it. I'm going to outlive my questions. Why, God? I'll outlive it. You ever have a question, why is this happening, God? You'll outlive that question. You know how many times, if you're just starting to read the Bible, you are going to be perplexed by some of the things you read. I can't justify it. I can't think. Ten years later, when you read it, you say, oh, that's what it means. You'll outlive your questions if you hang in there. So Jesus, knowing what the disciples were getting ready to face, some of which would be martyred, some of which would give their life, some of which would be beaten, some of which would be told never to speak in the name of Jesus again, some of which were imprisoned, some of which were confused and bewildered, some of which were wrote the word of God under inspiration of the Holy Ghost and were mocked for it. And the, the Bible was trying to, they tried to destroy it. But guess what? They, they outlived it. And still today, because he ascended, he dropped down the greatest great gift on the earth the world has ever seen. The baptism of the Holy Ghost with fire. And we are still outliving every challenge. The church is still here. The world tried to destroy it. People tried to destroy it. The enemy tried to destroy it. But the church of the living God is still alive and well. It's outliving every battle and every trial. Somebody shout glory to God if you believe by the power of the resurrection. We outlive it. He knew what they were getting ready to face. He knew they were going to need the power of the resurrection to believe there's life after the achievements. There's life after the pain. There's, there's life after the circumstance that's before you. There's life on the other side. And ultimately today there's eternal life that begins today. When you get saved, everlasting life begins right now. It doesn't begin when you die. It begins now. There's a new life living inside of you and that can't be taken away. So my prayer once again was today that there would be a conscious awareness that as you turn to the Lord that there is this life after 
that you can get past your achievements. How many have not gotten past achievements? Look, there are superstars depressed that are killing themselves. They've achieved everything in this world and they're not happy. Others are depressed and on prescription pills because they can't get past the pain. And others have anxiety through the roof because they can't face what's presently before them. And today, I'm offering you the only answer to that dilemma, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And nailed to his cross was your achievements, your pain, and your present circumstance. And three days later, he rose again from the dead by many infallible proofs beyond the reason, no shadow of any doubt. Bow your heads with me in prayer. Father, help us to get past whatever we need to get past. You're showing me, Lord, there's some that can't get past disappointments. Lord, help. Help now as we look to the cross. On the cross, you achieved, Lord. On the cross, you conquered pain. On the cross, you conquered present circumstance. You conquered it all. You conquered death, hell, and the grave. I believe today, Lord Jesus, that you died, were buried, and rose again from the dead. Say that with me, Lord, I believe. My faith is in you, exclusively in you. I don't trust in my own strength. I trust in you. Help me to know you, the power of your resurrection. This week, every day, even today, right now, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would fall upon your people right now. Touch them, Lord. We all stand to our feet. As my father's coming to close, we just sing that simple song because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Everybody can see. If your eyes are on Jesus, you can see. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Not just have looked, but looking continually unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of 
your faith. And that's where you're going to keep your victory. That's where you're going to draw from the power of his resurrection. As you continue to look to him. You look for him. You look to him. And he just over and over and over again keeps revealing his power to you and I. Death can't hold us. The grave can't hold us. The devil can't hold us. Because there's victory in Christ and what he did. He died, was buried, and rose again the third day day somebody say I believe it amen let the power of the Holy Spirit lift you raise you keep you from falling present you faultless before him as only God can do because I know He holds it. Because he lives. Because he lives. I can pray. fears are gone every one of them are gone because I know life is worth somebody say amen and praise God successes we have achieved, whatever pain we have experienced, whatever anticipations we have had, expectations, without Christ, they don't cut it. But in Christ, how many can say in Christ, in Christ, for Christ, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. We die daily, don't we? Amen? God is good. Tell your neighbor God is good. And you may be seated for one more brief moment. Before I dismiss you last week, I mentioned to you I was going to give you an update on the faith vow receiving since anniversary time but some have expressed that they wanted to give more so next week during our uh, ministry meeting 10 15 yeah that's next week already right wow where do the months go unbelievable So next week, we'll have a full, full account. So, so far, I think it was 11-2. 11 But more people wanted to get, to get. So already, we chopped down our, our overall debt from 102 to 90. 90 or something like that. That's good, right? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm not going to get into business meetings now. That'll be next week. 1015 show up we invite all of you to come out if you're part of the church you need to be here for that meeting if you want to be a part of the church come to that meeting uh, we're going to have a, a time of discussion about what took place what our vision is the summer's coming 
And uh, guess what uh, next feast we celebrate? The Feast of Pentecost is coming. So, God gave the Jewish people eight feasts. One was a weekly feast, which would be the Sabbath, and the other seven were yearly feasts. And uh, we just came to... Christ fulfilled all those feasts, by the way. We don't have to celebrate those feasts. We celebrate Jesus who completed. But they all pointed and painted a picture of what Christ would do, right? Passover, the blood, the sprinkling of the blood, the unleavened bread, getting the sin out of our life, amen. The first fruits, amen, unto God, Jesus, the first fruits risen from the dead, the firstborn among many. I can go on about the feasts, but they're all fulfilled in Christ. Christ fulfilled all. Can you say amen? But uh, we are preparing for what God wants to do next. So you need to be here this next Sunday. What does he want to do next like the pastor was sharing with you, with the church? And how do we prepare for the next? I'm going to tell you how. Through prayer and presenting ourselves. When we present ourselves to him and we begin to pray, God reveals to us how we can be prepared for what he wants to do next. Aren't you glad he's not done? He's not done. Amen? Because even in the scriptures it says that and the next uh, week Jesus appeared to them on, Right? The first day of the next week, he came back to talk to his to talk to his disciples. He's coming back and he's coming, he's coming, like the pastor said, he keeps on coming, and he keeps on coming to pull us into what's next. Praise the Lord. So we're gonna talk about that next week and uh, we're gonna get prepared. Now, what's on my heart, and I'm not gonna share it now, share it in the ten fifteen meeting next week is God is birthing a people of prayer in this house. We've had a people of praise. We've had a people of, of purpose. And he's birthing a people of prayer. He wants us to become a people of prayer so that we can move into what he has. Amen. Amen. We're going to be starting up some intercessory ministry prayer teams and whatnot, things are going to happen because we want to get to the next. We got to get to him who is the next and stay with him. Amen. Walk with him. Walk with him. And uh, that's for your personal life and for your partnership in the church as well. Praise the Lord. Having said all that, uh, next week we're going to have communion. Not only communion, but we're going to have a time where we're going to explain some vision. Tents are going up in the summer and all kinds of things are happening. We are embracing what's next. We are embracing what's now and we're embracing what's next. Amen? So there'll be some bagels there for those of you who don't like bagels, whatever, we'll be out there and we'll, we'll sit down and have a time together. If you'd like to be included in that faith vow today, was Probably this is it, right? And then sun, next Sunday you'll know. Uh, officially, it's over. But we're going to keep it going. For those of you that may, throughout time to time, God may bless you and you may say, I want to do it. But as a corporate thing, it, that's from anniversary to Easter. But if God lays something on your heart, do it. Amen? And we'll keep informing you where we're at. But uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all of your goodness. Thank you for the things you have done in our hearts and in our lives. Thank you for this church and the people here. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in their lives. 
and for what you want to do in their lives and give us God give us the ability to hear you to move into what you have for us here at this church God you have ordained good works for this place to walk in you have ordained good works for each of us to walk in help us Lord God to rise to that level where we can walk with you into those things that you've ordained for us bless now the church bless the people bless now everything Lord God that uh, that you're doing and God I just pray even for this faith vow that has gone on Lord God you are enough and what you have allowed us to have right now is enough but you're not done blessing you're not done blessing even though what we have for the time being is enough you want to take us past just enough into a land that's filled with good and plenty and so lord take us and carry us into that place where there is abundance and we move past just enough in jesus mighty name and we all said amen and amen and so if you'd like to uh, those of you that expressed you wanted to do something toward that faith i'll do it if not we're back to normal where we receive second offering toward whatever extras go on here and you can do so by putting b not v somebody say b b don't sound like v v v v B means building, okay? We've got the spring here. We're going to get some mulch and, you know, all kinds of beautiful things to prep this place. Amen? So, having said all that, may the Lord bless you. If you need an envelope, an usher come by and uh, bless the house of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this service. Pray a double portion upon our pastor, the pastor that came and brought the word today. Amen? Stretch your hands toward the servant of God and say, bless him. Bless him. Everything he's sown, let him reap back good measure. Let him reap more than what he gave out. Bless him. Bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.